Okay, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Marsha Tatarunga, and I am honored to be your dean at Evergreen State College, Tacoma Campus. And thank you. Thank you. We have an exciting night tonight. You are going to meet um, an elder, an elder who has done some amazing work uh, for our country. And um, you are going to meet her very soon, and she will be introduced. But I wanted to share with you also an image uh, of what I, I just want us to come into some focus tonight. Last week, we got to hear from Elmer Dixon, who was the founder of the Black Panther Party in the Seattle area. And what a great speech he gave. He was just a fabulous, dynamic person. And he was, of course, a mentor of mine for, for many years. Um, and it was really befitting that he came because it was the beginning of Black History Month. And today, we are going to have a speaker who represents the Puyallup Indian tribe. And I want you to know, I'm going to just say this because she has so many beautiful stories. So I think this is important for you to know. When Dr. Mim started the Evergreen State College Tacoma in her kitchen, she had six students in there. And soon it began to grow bigger than she could handle in her kitchen. And the first people that took her in and said, we have a classroom space for you, was the Puyallup Indian tribe. Yes. It was. It was a beautiful little house that I understand today was built by our guest here, Ramona Bennett. Yes, this is not a small, she looks kind of small, but she's big. She is a legend, okay? She has been out there in, the, in, in every corner where fighting has needed to be fought. She talked today about the Daybreak Star uh, in Seattle, in Fort Lawton. We know Fort Lawton was a naval base that really protected the United States in, during World War I and World War II. But what we don't know is people like Bernie White Bear, who actually Miss Ramona knew. These are people who are like giants in our history. They were the people who went up and she was one of them, to Fort Lawton, and took over that place until they created a space called Daybreak Star for the Native American people so that they would have a place they could be honored and remember their history. And it still stands to this day. So it took, it, these, these, fight, these fights you're gonna hear about today, yes, I want that projected, are not just, oh, today I'm gonna get up and I think I'll go fight for this and that. No, this was her life. And we only get to know about people's lives, particularly Native Americans, when we invite them into the room and we give them our undivided attention. Because we have lived in a country that we are standing today on Puyallup land. This is the Puyallup home. We are visitors here. So when we call up our visitor today, I want you to know how grateful we need to be because we didn't have to take over this land. And before, because we took it over, we have displaced the whole people. The second thing I want to share with you is this image. It's one of my favorite images, not because it's a beautiful image, but I want you to look at these two images. These two men are the same man. One is before he was taken away to the Carlisle boarding schools. And if you don't know that history, you need to know it. Native Americans were taken out of their homes and placed into boarding schools. And the objective was that we would, the, the American government was intended on, on killing the Indian, but saving the man. So in other words, they were gonna knock 
all that cultural understanding, all that history, that all that beautiful art, all that understanding of the, their connection to the earth was going to be knocked out of their head and opened into a new vessel in which new information was poured in. And that man you see up there becomes now the man on my left. You're right. And the first thing that was done, his hair, which is sacred and is never to be cut, was cut. That was the first move. And you can see the change of clothes. And I want you to look into the eyes and the face and tell me, was something lost when he went to school? Do you see something missing? I hope you do. And I hope you will think about what is missing in your life. What is the purpose of your education? And what is the purpose that somebody else had for you? And have you changed that? Are you here really thinking about why you are here and what you're going to do when you leave? Whose life you're going to make better when you get out of here? Because if you're not, you are not here for education. You're here for somebody else's education. And that's what it looks like. And so I want to honor today our speaker. I had to tell you this because I believe that our speaker today worked to make sure that the Indian humanity could be left whole. And I am sure that the man on the, this side was whole before he went to school. And so today we need to think about what did he get out of that education? And what, did, what are you here to get out of that education? And who are you going to look like when it's all over? Okay, so that is my primer for you to hear this incredible legend of all time. This is a huge giant that you're about to meet, and I'm going to introduce you to our own seminar facilitator here at Evergreen, Mr. Arlen Spites. Give him a hand. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arunga. Um, <clears throat> so I, I, I have the honor of introducing our uh, guest speaker for the evening. Uh, she's a pillar of the Puyallup Indian people, the community, uh, an Evergreen alum, um, a, uh, a veteran. Oh, yeah. Let's try that again. <clears throat> um, right on. Uh, a veteran of serious struggle. Um, the, uh, you may have heard of the fish ends in Washington State, and more about that later. Um, and um, the holder of a master's degree and uh, a doctorate from UPS. Um, and a hellraiser. Um, she, um, she was a, a, a central part of the fish ends, the activism that brought about uh, U.S. v. Washington, the Bolt decision um, that secured, um, affirmed the rights of Indian people in the Pacific Northwest um, to harvest fish the way um, that it should be done. Um, not only that, um, she uh, participated in uh, the takeover of the BIA building in Washington, D.C. Also, you know, this is one of the things that you learn about as the foundation upon which uh, Native Studies is done uh, these days. <clears throat> um, she also was involved in, the, in creating the model uh, that became the Indian Child Welfare Act, um, that, uh, that uh, the first big step in uh, reversing the damage done by expropriating Indian kids out of their communities and um, away from their, uh, the, their ability to be whole in their community. Um, so this is a, a very big deal. Um, also involved in the Wahilu Indian School, if you're familiar with that, and um, currently is, uh, directs 
Rainbow Youth and Family Services here in Tacoma, which, uh, which is a nonprofit. Uh, along the way, she was a uh, Puyallup Tribal Council member and tribal chair. Uh, so uh, please join me in uh, welcoming uh, your new hero, um, Ramona Bennett. Anyway, my name is Ramona Bennett, and I was born in 1938. And yes, I did ride a dinosaur to school when I was a little girl. <laughs> I lived in Seattle during my teen years and my early work life. And um, when I was in Seattle, I met these, uh, these Indians. Now, growing up, I thought my family were the only survivors because I see in John Wayne Theater and uh, the Indians all got killed. And so I assumed that the only survivors were my family, just a few people on Suquamish Reservation, a couple of people up Tulalip, a few people at Pialup, and uh, some up Swinomish. And that's how I grew up, you know, in, uh, in that world, but I was really lucky because Franklin High School, where I went to school, was a very diverse school, even way back then. And so I was able to hang out with uh, some Filipino girls. And they're kind of old girls now, but they're still around. And I still have uh, probably scars on my ankles from the uh, stick dances. Has anybody ever seen stick dances? Are any of you Indian? If you are, raise your hand. There's a hand back there and a hand up here. Good, good, to, good to be in all of your company. Um, so I lived in Seattle, and I became active with the American Indian Women's Service League. And those were some really brave women who had set up an Indian center for food, clothing, uh, job referrals, um, something like Indian centers are today, just uh, Band-Aid relief. But what was outstanding is, you know, there really were no dogs or Indians allowed signs. There was a lot of prejudice against Indians, and a lot of Indians tried to pretend like they were black Irish or they were Italian or anything because of the stigma about the dirty, drunken, lazy Indians. And so to be able to get a job, it wasn't a good idea to say that you were Indian. And so these women stepped forward, um, and I got to know them, and they drafted me into helping them. The director of the program was a Macaw Indian woman, little tiny, short, heavy, rowdy woman. And she found out I could type and talk. And so she got me to start writing letters asking for support for the Indian Center. And that's the very first stage of grant writing. Are some of you learning how to be grant writers? Hope so, because it's always needed. But I. Uh, learned how to write letters asking for support, and then they'd send me out to meet with the businesses or committees, and so I had to talk. And all the way through school, I couldn't talk, but I did take debate and I did take drama to try to overcome that, and so I was able to use those skills to be able to talk, but I, I told Pearl, you know, I really can't talk in front of people. And she told me, when you have something to say, you'll be able to talk. 
And so for those of you who have that same problem, just know it's absolutely true. When, when you have something that needs to be said, you will be able to say it. And um, I told a story this morning about my uh, debate coach. His name was Byron Samuelson, and um, he taught me if you're in an argument with someone or in a debate with someone, know their points, know their points better than they do. Really understand where they're coming from. And, um, and I did that, I do that. And um, then in 1953, when I was a sophomore, there was a McCarthy committee, a Senate committee, that was uh, against communists. Um, and they pulled my debate coach into the McCarthy committee and asked him, are you now or have you ever been a member of, of a subversive party? And he said, you can't legally ask me that question. And they pulled his teacher's certification and they literally broke his heart and killed him. And I never, I never ever forgot how really cruel this government can be. How, I mean, that taught me everything that I needed to know about people who stand up, stand out, are different, um, have a strong belief, um, believe in the people, basically. And so, um, you know, I used what um, Samuelson taught me um, in making pitches for that Indian Center to help build it up so it could help more people or help the people better. And um, I met um, a lot of Indians in Seattle that had survived John Wayne <laughs> happily. <laughs> I wasn't the only Indian. And um, we found out that Fort Lawton was being surplused and when land is surplus by the federal government, it's supposed to go back to the tribe. And here, Duwamish tribe has got nothing. They've got no land. They don't even have recognition. And so we were climbing over fences and climbing up bluffs and uh, running through the gates. And um, we had uh, talked to Senator Jackson and he just blew us off. And so we were really demanding uh, Fort Lawton. And in the end, um, we settled for a small sender, but the guy that I worked with the most closely was Bernie White Bear. And we both worked in auto freight and billing departments. We were Teamsters. And so we made pretty good money, and, and we were highly skilled. And so we wrote plans for the property there at Fort Lawton. And the plans included a school system and a clinic, a whole big clinic, and um, early childhood education, and a culture center, and job training, and a culture center and, you know, all kinds of services and all kinds of uh, cultural programs. And um, then I went to a meeting. I drove my mom to a meeting here in Tacoma because uh, we're Puyallup. And so I come to this meeting and there was a recall petition and they recalled the whole consul, all five of them. And that left five openings on the consul. 
and I was nominated and I was elected. And this is in 1968. And here I had a nice little brick house with hardwood floors and a white picket fence in Seattle, in Northeast Seattle, out in the U District. And all of a sudden now I'm elected to a tribal council of my own tribe that has nothing. In 1968, the Puyallup tribe had not had an updated enrollment since 1929. I mean, you know, the median lifespan of an Indian is only 45 years. And so there were only 170 people off the original roll that were even still alive. And the tribe had no recognized fishing rights, no health services. Now, these are all treaty rights, no educational opportunities no land, the Presbyterians even owned our cemetery. The Puyallup tribe had nothing, almost no members, no dollars, no recognized rights or services. Um, the tribe had lost three court cases in state court and so it was not even a recognized tribe. Think about that. The Puyallup tribe was on empty. We were at absolutely zero. But, you know, growing up, one of the most important, the most important thing to me was that I'm Indian. I mean, I, I guess my mom brainwashed me because uh, she told me, if you want to study savages, steady European history. You know, I came home from school and said, in the year of 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Columbus discovered America, Mama. And she said, we were never lost. I painted a picture of Sacagawea. I brought it home and uh, my mother said, she is our Benedict Arnold. She led the blue-eyed barbarians over the pass. She was not having my Sacagawea picture. Then I brought home, um, I brought home a, a thing I had handwritten with a picture of Chief Seattle, and it had one of his beautiful speeches, and my mother said, uh, Chief Katsop was always my favorite chief. And I said, well, Mama, there was nothing, there was nothing in the library that, um, that he had said. And she said, well, he didn't talk to white people. That's why he was my favorite chief. <laughs> so so she, she told me the Asians had alphabets and written materials when the Europeans were still swinging from tree to tree by their tails. Well, that's what she said. <laughs> the first day of school, this is my mom. The first day of school, remember I said I never talked in class? This is the reason. My first day in school, the teacher says, uh, who knows Mary had a little lamb? And I held my hand up. I hadn't learned to not talk in class yet. And the teacher says, you know, looks at the seating chart and asks me, uh, go ahead and recite it. And I said, Mary had a little lamb 
her father shot it dead. <laughs> and now it goes to school with her between two hunks of bread. <laughs> and they were horrified. <laughs> they, were, they were horrified. And it wasn't until high school when Byron Samuelson got hold of me that I started talking again in class. <laughs> I mean, that'll shut you up in a hurry. But, so that, that's the woman that raised me, and it kind of, it kind of explains me. Um, I, I was working with a class of social workers, and uh, you know, one of the one of the things I said is that um, as a kid, you know, I grew up. We lived in the woods in a cabin. We literally had an outhouse and an outdoor pump, and it was a domestic violence family. And so I read to survive. How many of you read to survive? Few of you. It's, it. I guess it's more social. How many of you are going to be social workers? Yeah, it's. I see that hand back there. Um, I guess it is more social workers, but uh, the discussion the discussion was reading to survive, and they asked me what I read when I was a kid, and my mom always bought me comic books, and she bought me Little Lulu. Little Lulu was a problem solver. If there was any kind of a dispute or debate, she always worked out a solution so everybody was happy. And then my other comic books were Wonder Woman, and Wonder Woman with her magic bracelets and her lariat. Um, and she was always saying, I'll save you, Steve. <laughs> and she did. And so, that was that was my early upbringing. Now suddenly I'm on a tribal council, and see just thirty miles down the road in Seattle, I was working and writing and fighting um, for opportunities for the Indians of Seattle, and suddenly here I am in Tacoma. And I'm on my own tribal council, and we got none of the stuff that we were trying to establish in Seattle for the urban Indians and the Duwamish tribe. We have nothing. We're on empty. And so um, up in Seattle, Urban League, um, worked with us, they helped us, and we helped them. If they needed to be someplace, we'd be there with them. And it was during the Vietnam War, and have any of you ever heard about peace strikes? Well, you know what? You're probably going to be participating in peace strikes pretty soon, so you better steady up. It's when your government is so effing crazy, they're killing people, and the people they're killing are never white, except Germany. That was the one exception. <laughs> but, you know, the, the people are always brown people that the government is murdering. And so um, we went to peace strikes. We marched. We barricaded things. You know, we fought side by side, you know, all of us working together. And so uh, up in Seattle, you know, we had made a lot of friends, and the people at Urban League were part of that. So when I found myself here in Tacoma with a tribe that didn't even, had never had an office, the Bureau of Indian Affairs had sold off all of our land, 
and then they closed up their little carpet bags and they left. And they left us with no uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs agency office. And if any of you ever go to an Indian reservation in Montana, South Dakota, Eastern Washington, um, all of the tribes have a Bureau of Indian Affairs office, and that's who decides what's going to happen there. But we didn't have one, and so we were uh, untrained. <laughs> we weren't tamed and controlled. We were like the crazy Indians that had never had anybody tell us what to think or what to do. And so um, now I'm on this console, and I went to Urban League. I went to Urban League right here in Tacoma. And um, Tom Dixon was the director. Now, see, I thought they had been there for 15 years. But they had just opened their doors. I didn't know this until they had their 50-year anniversary um, just the other day. And serious, I, I go in thinking they're well-established and have been there forever. And they literally had just opened. And I was the first one that walked through the door. And I said, I've been elected to tribal council for the Puyallup tribe, and I'm going to establish them. Uh, not reestablish, because the tribe had never been established, but I'm going to establish them. And I don't have, um, I don't have a place to work. I don't have a desk. I don't have a typewriter. I don't have a phone or a copy machine. I don't have anything. And Tom Dixon said, there's your desk, there's your phone, there's a typewriter, there's a copy machine, and that's your secretary. I have a secretary, <laughs> right on. And so that's where I worked to begin with. And, um, you know, I typed up a bunch of uh, press statements, got busy on the legal problems the tribe had had, and started writing grants. And it was all still in my head from Seattle, from working with Bernie. You know, he did um, Seattle Indian Health Board. I did the Kwachi Puyallup Tribal Clinic. Uh, he did Thunderbird uh, treatment program, and I did the Puyallup treatment program. And the Indians in Seattle did Heritage School, and I did Chief Leshai. Just wrote all of the preliminary uh, grants and lobbied them through and, and got these programs going. But the other thing was um, fishing rights. Grandfather Creator put on every river a family of Indians to protect the brothers and sisters, the nations of salmon. That's what we're here for. And if you don't have a right to harvest, you have no voice in protecting the salmons. It, it goes together. And so we, um, we had on every river had, had a deprivation of that right to harvest for 90 years. And all of the tribes fought back, every single one of them. Remember I said there were no dogs or Indians allowed signs? Well, that means that there weren't jobs. And so the families were really dependent on their ability to harvest salmon for food for their table and to sell commercially. And so um, 
everybody had resisted, everybody had fought back. But when we set up an armed camp here on the Puyallup River, the thing that was different about us is we're visible. We're downtown. You know, if the fisheries and game wardens went after Indians that were fishing up at Nooksack or over Swinomish or down Skokomish, by the time the press got there, um, the Indians were beat up, their nets were slashed, the bottoms were beat out of the canoes and the boats, and if there was an outboard motor, they the game wardens would pick it up and just drop it in salt water and ruin it. Um, but they would be gone and the action would be over. And so it was never visible. But when we set up an armed camp right here in Tacoma, we were out there in front of God and everyone. There was no missing it. And we knew how to call the press, and we did. And so uh, the morning of the bust of the Puyallup fishing camp, um, we had cleared all the kids out. It was uh, September 9th, and we had cleared the, the kids out of the camp. It was all adults and uh, some teenagers. Um, you know, like our kids that were 14, 15, 16 years old, uh, some of them stayed with us. And 550 pigs from all of the surrounding areas were there. They were called in. And um, Fort Lewis was on red alert. And there were only 60 of us in the camp. Now, I don't know, is that how much hate they have or is that how afraid of Indians they are? And then what really, um, what's really important is they did not come in because of fisheries and game department. It was the health department um, their uh, boss, McNutt, um, ordered us shut down as a health issue. I mean, if they were worried about our health, would they really send in 550 armed pigs to gas us and club us? You know, how many of you are aware of Standing Rock and Dapple? Any of you hear of that? See, I, you know, I told those guys when they first set up, I told them it, it <clears throat> the federal marshals will come in, but it won't have a damn thing to do with, uh, with the uh, pipelines. It'll be the health department. And you guys know it was the health department. And there were no health issues. They did a good job with their camp. They kept things up good, and we did too. Um, but that's the, are you having a side conversation, or do you think I'm funny? <laughs> Can't tell. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, it was the health department. And we had, um, so they came in on us. And in that, in that situation, um, I was looking at 35 years in prison for um, riot and um, arson and various other charges. But that morning I told the chief of police, you know, you have no jurisdiction here. If you come here, you will be trespassing. And so there were um, 60 of us that were arrested, several people from Canada, uh, Alcatraz. Any of you heard of Alcatraz? 
Yeah, there were um, some people up from Alcatraz, people down from Canada. And I don't know if you guys know about the bail system, but if you're from out of town or out of the area, you have a very high bail because you are you are apt to flee the scene. And so uh, there were um, some very high bails. And John Trudell, now has anyone heard of John Trudell? Hmm. What was the name of that movie again? Thunderheart? Yeah, John Trudell played the, sh the chain shifter, but um, he also was a poet and, uh, and an actor. But then he was a kid from Alcatraz, and he come up with a briefcase. He says, I'm here to bail everyone out. And he had uh, $70,000 in a briefcase, <laughs> he was just a kid. But uh, they had taken up a collection uh, down in California and that's what he brought. And so uh, I took him to C.J. Johnson, our uh, bail bondsman, and uh, he says, I'm here to bail everyone out. And <laughs> C.J. told him, uh, the bail is $350,000. He went, what? And so the 70,000 and what we had raised bailed some people out, but then a bunch of elderly people, now remember this is 1970, and in 1970 you could buy a whole house for $15,000, really, and um, and so uh, these elderly people came in with the titles to their homes. That's how much they trusted us and believed in us. They knew if somebody had a court date, they would appear. They, they trusted us. And they put out their titles to their homes, which is your life savings. You know, if you have a title to a home, you've worked your entire life to get that. And they put up the titles to their homes and they got everybody out. And um, I was looking at 35 years in prison. And so um, Hank Adams, and if, if you want to study geniuses, Hank Adams would be a good one. Um, Hank Adams had gone to D.C. He met with the Department of Interior. He met with their um, legal department. And he came back with a solicitor's report that said, we own the river, we own the property, we were the only ones with jurisdiction there. And all, all of those law enforcement agencies were trespassing. And he brought that paper back. And they dropped all the charges. They never apologized. They bulldozed our clothes. They bulldozed our teepees. They bulldozed my little tiny typewriter. They, my my little tape recorder with my powwow music. I mean, they just bulldozed everything like we were nothing. On our property, they came and they done that. So now later on, uh, somebody scheduled a debate between me and um, Dan Evans, the governor, and Slade Gorton, the Attorney General. Do you guys know who those people are? Well, they, they were Republicans and they were really down on us. So they scheduled a debate at UPS at the Fieldhouse. And, um, and so I went, there were, thank you. There were 
about 700 people there, and there's this debate scheduled, and everybody turned out, and uh, they wanted me to speak first. And you know why they wanted me. How many of you are in debate or have been in debate? Are you the only one that's ever done anything? <laughs> None of you? Oh, come on, somebody else. Okay. Well, then you, you guys know why they wanted me to speak first, so they could smear me, take what I said, and just smear me all over the stage. And so they wanted me to speak first. So I did. And guess what I did? I did what Byron Samuelson told me to do. I put down every single point they were going to make, and then I countered it and knocked it down. And then I made my points. And then Dan Evans and Slade Gorton stepped up and said, there's nothing more to say. And, and, and everybody said, yay. It was, and I said, this, that one's for you, Sammy. Because that's what everybody called Byron Samuelson. And, uh, I gave I gave that one to him. So we now US versus Washington was filed because people sitting around their dinner tables watching television seeing Indians being clubbed, dragged, arrested, beat down and they um there was an outcry and that outcry resulted in a court case. And that court case is the Bolt decision, or US versus Washington. And it was a big landmark uh, decision that really helped Indians who harvest, no matter what they harvest, because it made very clear that these protected rights under the treaty um, are protected by the United States government. And so we, um, we were able to achieve that. We were able to establish services. Um, we had not even owned our ancestors' bones. The Presbyterians owned our cemetery. Um, every single tribe was put into a hat Congress let the denominations draw tribes out, and they gave them land on the reservations to civilize the savages. And so um, the Presbyterians got the Puyallups. And so um, I took clippings from the fishing camp and us fighting back and send it to the Presbyterians and told them they had um, not kept their contractual obligation to civilize us because we were still fighting back. And they, um, they gave us the title back to our cemetery. Now the next thing that we did, <laughs> you ready for a next thing? How long do you guys plan on being here? No, really. Um, we started at 6. It's 10 after 7. How long do you think this class lasts? Hmm? What time? 8. Really? You'll miss me. <laughs> Well, then we had no land, and the tribe had sold property to the United States government for an Indian hospital. And the, um, the Indian hospital was built, and it was really beautiful. 
Well, it was no sooner done when our neighbors got jealous, of course. But the reason we sold the land was so we would have good medical services and jobs. And it was not our hospital, it was a regional hospital for the natives from Alaska, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Montana. And, um, and Indians were brought there for services. And uh, then there was a TB epidemic, tuberculosis. Do some of you know about tuberculosis? It was, it was devastating. I mean, it, was, it wasn't just an Indian problem, but it was a big, big health problem everywhere. But it became a tuberculosis sanatorium. And then when tuberculosis stopped being a critical problem, they just shut it down. And they gave the property to the state on a 20-year lease. And the way it was, was every year the state used it, they got 5% of it. So at the end of 20 years, they would own it outright. And it was like to the 19th year when, uh, you know, when we started fighting back. And the, um, I had um, gone to the Native American Rights Fund, um, which is called NARF, and I asked the Cracker Jack top of the line lawyers to represent us. And they said um, they wouldn't represent us because it was a losing case and it would screw up their funding. And so they kicked me aside. And they um, then um, I had gone as far as I could to all of the tribes and talk to them about all of that. And, um, you know, they, they were 100% uh, agreed, you know, if it wasn't being used for a hospital anymore, then it should be, should revert back to the tribe. And so I went to Dan Evans, who was at that time the governor, and I told him, um, you know, what our, what our plans were. And he said, <clears throat> well, he investigated, did a little research, and he said, um, well, the state has $1.6 million um, in improvements. Well, that was bars on the windows, and they had built a little group home. But they were using it for a diagnostic center for kids. And it was like a state boogeyman. If you were a teenager and you were acting up, they'd ship you there. And they had, in a room about half this size, <clears throat> they had 26 kids in each pod. Well, you take 26 disturbed kids who are isolated from their families and put them all together. I mean, how are you going to diagnose what their, what their potential is or what their problems are? I mean, it's, it's a zoo, and it's a dangerous zoo because people, when they're caged up, tend to get mean. And so, uh, you know, uh, Evans, had, Evans had told me that. And so I did, <clears throat> when I was a kid, if something was impossible, my mom would always say, well, that would take an act of Congress. Anybody you ever hear that saying? Yeah, well, that would take an act of Congress. And so I drew up a line item request, which is an act of Congress, and I 
took it to DC and started lobbying it. And, um, you know, I told the congressman what the dealy do was. And, you know, it's hard to get appointments with those people. And so uh, they have tunnels. They leave their offices and they, they go to their uh, meeting chambers and their general assemblies. And so when they ring a bell, they come out of their offices and hurry along these tunnels. And so, <clears throat> in high heels, of course, um, they would uh, come out of their office and I'd run with them, um, pitching whatever it was I was pitching, whether it was the school, the clinic, the building, fishing, fireworks, whatever it was that I was back there to lobby for, um, I just run with them. And um, I got the support I needed. I had, uh, I got my votes, you know. Oh, you, you haven't even heard how this goes. I had my votes, and uh, Duncan or Regula or one of them guys. Said, uh, well, your, your uh, whole thing would be much stronger. Well, I'm sure he didn't say it that way, but your, uh, your possibilities would be enhanced if you, uh, had your own congressman present it. Well, that was Floyd Hicks here, and Floyd Hicks was on the Armed Services Committee, nothing to do with Indian Affairs, but that was our congressman. And so um, they, the congressman walked me over to uh, Floyd Hicks's office and Floyd Hicks, um, you know, I showed, you know, I showed him my my pitch, and he showed me a beautiful picture of the hospital that he had on his wall in his office. And he said, "Well, when we present it, I'll bring this picture." And he was like, "You know, all all for me and all for it," and so. He called Dan Evans, the governor, and he says to Dan Evans, he said, um, did, um, did you tell Ramona Bennett that the state would convey the hospital property back to the tribe, and uh, Dan Evans laughed. He says, well, yeah, he said, uh, <clears throat> if she uh, paid $1.6 million, and uh, he said, <laughs> Floyd Hicks says, uh, well, are you going to do that? And, he says, well, no, my constituents wouldn't tolerate that. And Floyd Hicks said, uh, you lied to her? And he, he says, well, no, she doesn't have $1.6 million. Floyd says, uh, she has a line item request and she has the votes. She has $1.6 million. So are you going to keep your word? And he says, well, no, my constituents wouldn't tolerate that. And so Floyd Hicks said, well, then you did lie to her. And so, you know, after all that work and all that running around in tunnels and writing and campaigning, um, I came back home, and uh, there was a hospital building, um, and... We had gotten a little tiny clinic, a little double-wide clinic at the top of our cemetery. 
and um, we um, asked the state if we could use the fifth floor of the hospital for a celebration event for our new clinic, and they loaned it to us, and then um, we evicted them with automatic weapons. I used I used our law enforcement and kicked the state out, which left me with 188 kids, and they tried to charge me with kidnap because they wanted to they wanted to come and get their kids and put them in Western State, and I wouldn't let them because. They needed to have diagnostic programs in all the regions. It doesn't make, you know, it's poor people whose kids get locked up. And if you're a poor family in Spokane and they've shipped your kid to Tacoma, you know, how are you going to be any kind of support or comfort or part of treatment or anything? And so, from my early working life, I knew how to operate a PBX. It's old-time phones so like you see in the movies. <laughs> and so we're in the building, and it's a PBX system, and I'm the only one that knows how to operate it. So I'm plugging into the lines that light up and uh, saying, Pialop Tribe, and they're going, I have a son over there, and I heard that Indians have taken over. And so we have we have better social workers than the state, and we're all here in the building. Your kids are safer now than they've ever been. And so they did do diagnostic programs in all of the regions. They did do that, and. Um, <clears throat> Now, while we're in the building, this is the last week in October, just before the election. The governor is up for re-election. We're in the building. Every single newspaper, every single radio, every single TV channel comes, and they say, why are you here? And what's the answer? Because the governor's a liar. Because Dan Evans, Dirty Dan, the governor man, lied through his teeth. Uh, we tried legislatively. We tried administratively. This is our property. And so we just evicted the state because it's ours. And so... We had the kids for a couple of days. There are so many side stories to this whole situation, but that was in October of 76. Um, by the time the tribe got the title in 1980, I had been recalled. Remember how I got in? It was a recall election. Well, I got recalled out. I got recalled in, I got recalled out. And um, from there, um, you know, um, our first little office at the tribe was in the cemetery. And right through the gate was the regional administrator for DSHS. And so, um, people's kids would be taken away from them, and they'd come to me for help. And we'd try to talk to the social workers, and they wouldn't talk to us. And so um, I would do little thumbnail write-ups on the families, and then I'd go through the gate to the regional administrator. And that regional administrator would then call the area manager, who would call the supervisor, who would call the social worker, and then they'd have to come to Jim Anderson's office, and I'd be there with the family whose kid had been taken, or kids. And um, then we could negotiate, 
and get some kids returned to their families or get some families foster licensed. And um, he liked the way that worked. And so Jim Anderson called for a statewide meeting of all of the regional administrators and the tribal councils. And that happened. And we talked about what we were doing and it became a statewide policy. But in my mind, Creator put the gate there um, and put the regional administrator, probably the only one in the state with, with that kind of compassion and mindset that, that could make things happen. And so the whole child welfare manual came from uh, that. It was called the Local Indian Child Welfare Advisory Committee. And we had it in operation. And after that, the Catholics had a sibling group that are my first cousins. And it really became down and dirty. We got the kids for a visit, kidnapped them, had warrants all over the state, and um, went to a Lutheran rally, collected enough money to go to DC and lobby for national relief, national legislation. But we already had a model working right here. And so we were, um, we were able to uh, make that happen through the Congressional Committee, the Senate Committee, <clears throat> National Tribal Chairman's Association, and National Congress of American Indians. Uh, we were able to get enough action collectively to uh, get that national legislation going. And in, in the end, those, uh, those kids uh, grew up to all be Indians. <laughs> but, you know, it, I mean, do you get from this that nothing happened without a fight and a struggle? I mean, every single damn thing that we tried to do, we ran into obstacles and just had to keep pushing. But, um, you know, um, you'll find yourself thinking, you know, well, somebody ought to do something about this. And, and the thing that's important to remember is you are somebody. And sometimes you are gonna have to be the person that does it. <clears throat> now, the way I supported myself, now remember, I was a teamster, and I made good money. But when I came down here to Tacoma, uh, there was no wage. Um, I set up a student grant through Evergreen, and I lived on my student grant when I did a lot of this work. And I'd write a press statement, write a court brief, write a grant, and, and it was all checked off by my professors at Evergreen. And, um, I lived on the grants and I did the work under contracted studies. And I did um, go from here to, uh, to um, the University of Puget Sound master's program. And Evergreen was so new, I was the first non-graded Evergreen graduate to go there. And so they had a big, boy, they had, they, 
<clears throat> they brought them all out, you know, sitting around a huge big table to analyze me and see if I was worthy of their uh, graduate, their education graduate school. And um, <clears throat> it was kind of last minute that, that I had started working on enrollment. And so they had, uh, I didn't take an SAT or, or any of that. And so I said, well, what can I do? And they said, well, Miller Analogy. Have any of you heard of that? Miller Analogy, just one person. Well, see, you weren't the only one that knew that one. <laughs> but uh, the Miller Analogy was being offered at PLU that night. And so I just zipped out there, paid my $70, and took this test. And um, so now when the University of Puget Sound Committee is reviewing me, they, um, I mean, they were delving into Evergreen, you know, through me. And they, they knew what I had been doing, but they didn't know if... Uh, Evergreen was up to their little snobby standards. And um, <clears throat> this envelope came out, and, and it got passed around the table, and everybody that looked at it went like, like that. And um, I didn't know what it was, but it was my Miller analogy and it got handed all the way around. And um, the Miller analogy has 60 questions, and you only have to get 15 right to pass. But they said, what tests, there are eight tests, they said, what test did you take? And I said, it was Greek mythology. It's all Greek to me. <laughs> they, said, <laughs> they said, you only have to have 15 right. You have all 60 right. <laughs> well, if I took it the day before, I probably would have bombed her the day after. But that day, I knew everything. And it's, uh, they said, how do you know so much about Greek mythology? And I said, well, when I was a kid, I never could find any books about uh, Indian legends. But there were lots of books about Greek mythology. And so I read all of them. And that day, I could remember absolutely everything. <laughs> and so they, they let me in. And they probably gave Evergreen credit for <laughs> what a genius they thought I was. But any, anyway, um, my, uh, my doctorate from the University of Puget Sound is an honorary doctorate. And it is based on both the activism and the uh, academic work that I did with the tribe. So, so I got like double degrees for, uh, for the work I did with the tribe. First, uh, Evergreen, my undergraduate degree and my basic life support for four years, and then, uh, and then the University of Puget Sound, uh, the doctorate for that work. I am a guru, oh, and a, so I did sit and okay. and a wizard and a ninja. Yes, I had oh, I had a whole I had a whole bunch of very well documented attempts on my life, and I, was, uh, I know this is true. And I swear I am a ninja. There were many times when I worked with a a group called United Construction Workers Association. And we also worked with the Alaskan Cannery Workers Association. So it was black and brown and white 
workers. I dropped out of graduate school because I wanted to do some work. And I met this woman, and my life turned around. What she talks about is serious. We were in battle. I got beat up. Oh, yeah, thrown in jail, all kinds of things. But one of the oldest songs that we have ever, ever had in the movement is, is those who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. And it never comes. You just got to keep on. You think you're free, and then you got to do some more. And you think you're free, and you got to do some more. And I learned that and the possibilities of winning. Because you all wouldn't be sitting in these seats if we didn't win. And we, come on, that's just some, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Woo, yeah. We're reading a book called Alchemy. Does anybody know what alchemy means? What does alchemy mean? Science. It is a science. That's right. Who said that? You did? Good. Let's give him a hand. Is it you who said that? Who said that? Well, okay. But it's, it's not only science. It's the science of changing lead to gold. But when you become gold, you need to remember the lead. Because you needed that to do what? to turn into, yes, and this is what she does for us. She remembers where she comes from, yes, and she makes us remember where we come from, right? And it is because of her that I do believe in freedom, and it is because of this woman that's walking back out right there, my dean, let's give her a hand, come on. Was it a good speech she gave you? Yes. yes. What an amazing person. Yes. And um, I thought about that. I'm very serious. I want us to think about how every time you come here, every time you go to a class, every time you're talking to a faculty, and every time you are reading something, you are being changed. The question is, how are you being changed? And are you in charge of your process, your change process? Because you could be changed and you didn't know you were changed and you could be changed not for the better, right? So just like the photographs I showed you up there, I was thinking that the man, when he had his earrings and his long hair and just there was something about his face that he knew who he was. He was clear about who he was. And I think that's what's so beautiful about our speaker. She's very clear also about who she is. And I think about people who stand up with that kind of courage that she had. Any minute now, any one of us, maybe every one of us may be called. Are you ready? Are you prepared? Yes, you need to think about, do you know enough to be able to step out there and be confident? And are you ready? Have you read? Have you done your study? Do you know more today than you knew yesterday? We don't have time to waste. We are living in hard times. We, it is up to us. If none of you are gonna stand up in our society, and say, it's wrong the way this is happening. This needs to change. If you, if nobody in this room is gonna do that, guess what? There will be no change. Yes. Well, we, we didn't talk at all about uh, pipelines or environment. Uh, I mean, that's, that's another whole section, but, uh, I think you're going to have a couple of films. Um, how many of you have seen As Long as the Rivers Run? Th that's it? OK, there's a film that was made here in the 70s about the, you've seen it? <laughs> Are you the only one that's ever done anything? Uh, 
anyway, there's a film as long as the rivers run, and then there's a new one, uh, Ancient Waters, and it's uh, it's all about environment here, and uh, the main focus is on the Puyallup tribe, but truly, um, there are 14 uh, environmental organizations that are took the lead, knew about this long before we did. The uh, Puget Sound Energy doesn't need no stinking permits. And so they had already um, were well underway with their construction. Like I, like I said this morning, if you build a chicken coop in your yard and you didn't have a permit, you'd have <laughs> law enforcement and the fire department and all of them just all up in your business. But PSE can build something that's going to hold 8 million gallons of liquefied natural gas, and they don't need no stinking permit because they have got money and influence. And you know what? They're not even American. I mean, like, <laughs> as, as an Indian, that doesn't really mean that much to me. But they're, but they're, not, they're not even American. They're Canadian and Norwegian and Australian and uh, Dutch. And they're from everywhere on the globe except here but they can come here and poison our water and potentially blow all of our asses away and vaporize us. They, they, can, they can do that without permits. So, you know, it's, uh, there is a film about that, and I hope, I hope somebody will show it to you guys. And so, uh, those are a couple of things that we didn't talk about that that are really much more current than the things I talked about tonight. But you know when you uh, you know when you see uh, when you see our Puyallup tribe in the Emerald Queen Casino, uh, just know that nobody gave us anything. Nobody felt sorry for us. Um, Every single thing we have came from a lot of hard work by a lot of good people. And, uh, and like I said, you know, I didn't do it alone. The, the story about uh, Evergreen, um, there was something called the Comprehensive Employment Training Act. And when I was on consul at the beginning, um, I got a grant, and it was a pretty big grant because it was based on unemployment. And like I told you guys, um, unemployment was it was major. And so I got this money, and it was to train people, and you could get training materials, supplies. And so I bought a bunch of lumber and pipe and wire and stuff, and. I hired journeymen teachers and a whole bunch of unemployed Indians, and they built a building. They built a big brown building at the top of the cemetery property, and uh, that was our first offices that really were ours that we owned, and we. Uh, we had that, and Maxine Mims and Joy Hardiman, they came to me, and they they knew that my immediate family were all gooey ducks, and so they uh, they wanted to do a Tacoma campus for Evergreen, and um, I had a courtroom and I had a conference room that we had built with our own little hands. And so that was the first space that Evergreen had in Tacoma. And um, 
Yay. And so, you know, just, just know that uh, Urban League, which is primarily a black organization, uh, gave us our first helping hand. And we helped the college out uh, to get situated in uh, Tacoma. And it's, uh, you know, it, it's all good. It's all uh, cooperation. And then <clears throat> we did the Indian Child Welfare Act, and we did child placing. Um, but it was all Indian-specific dollars. But we would license an Indian home, and we would go to the white receiving home to get the Indian children. And the black children would go get their coats and try to come with us. And <clears throat> so I promised that I'd do something about that. And so I did an agency. I founded an agency. It wasn't a nonprofit, and I don't do that anymore. But I named it Rainbow Youth and Family Services. And uh, I would go out to a black family, and there'd be a bunch of kids there. Well, when the white licensors went, they saw a gang. If there were a bunch of black kids, it had to be a gang. I know it's the team, the cousins, or the choir, or just the kids in the neighborhood. And so I didn't have that prejudice, and so I was able to recruit a lot of black families. And we did a lot of same race black placements and all races, uh, same race placements. And <clears throat> a son I raised, do any of you know Charles Carson? God, poor Charles, nobody knows him. Anyway, <clears throat> Charles, my son Luchbetsu brought Charles home. He said, he needs a good mother, and you are a good mother. Will you be his mother? And he had been in 15 different foster and group homes. He'd been in Raymond Hall 18 times. He was stripped, beat, shot, and left for dead the week before over his brother's bad drug deal. And um, I told him if he could stay clean and stay in school, he'd have a home and family as long as he needed one. And so he lived with us. He graduated Oakland. Um, he went to TCC. And then I brought him to Maxine and Joy. And they mentored him. And he graduated from here. And then did his master's at Tacoma Campus, University of Washington. And when I retired, he stepped in and took over all of the families and all of the unfinished adoptions. And um, his agency is called Beautiful Birds. And to this day, he does, uh, he does adoptions and foster licensing. So, um, the, I'm not working at it anymore, but the work continues. And so that's that's my black son. I'm real proud of him. So I, I think we can go to questions now, if we have uh, questions for Ramona. I, I think it's time to go. <laughs> well, uh, you know, we have this thing called give back, so... Um, Let's, uh, uh, for those, um, the Upward Bound students, I think we did it last time as well. So uh, we uh, give back to the presenter and uh, tell her what we've gained, what we've learned um, from her words. So, um, looks like Annie. Thank you so much for coming here tonight. It was an honor to hear you speak 
to hear your stories. Um, I wish we had more of this and that, that we would have times when our elders would come and, and bestow this kind of knowledge on us. Um, and so I really appreciate you giving of your time and your energy to not only go to morning class, but also to stick around and, and hang out with us here at night. How, how many of you were in both sessions? How many of you were here this morning too? None of you? No, okay. More give back. Um, I learned that um, it's important to um, stand what stand up for like what you believe in, no matter like hard it, how hard it gets, you know, even if it like is detrimental kind of like to yourself, because at the end of the day, like it's important to help others that don't necessarily know how to help themselves or can't really like help themselves. So, yeah. I just want to say thank you for coming and sharing with us your inspiration on fighting against the system and for not taking what the original rules are that they've placed on us and finding what's just and right. Thank you. I just wanna say thank you. Um, it's such an honor to be in the room with an elder I'm not sure if they've written your book yet, but we've all experienced your story. You've mentioned names and places and people that we can carry with us and take your story. So we have real life history right now. And I just wanna say that um, I don't take it for granted. I'm sure my nine-year-old son won't take it for granted. And I hope that we can all share your story so your inspiration and your fight can continue to live. Thank you. I'm, I'm one of the most interviewed people, and uh, there's a lot, a lot of Google information, a lot of YouTube information, uh, a lot of Facebook stories, and I'm, you know, there are several people that are compiling material. I don't know what's going to come of it, but I mean, it's definitely out there. We have time for a couple more give back. Um, I just want to say thank you for coming out tonight. Um, I like the stories that you told about your childhood and when you brought your light stuff home to your mom, what your mom would say about like, you know, Columbus and Sacagawea and stuff. Because, you know, a lot of America's history is like, um, it's not all facts. So, definitely have some stuff to uncover for me. Well, I've, I've, I have a little, I have a little pitch that uh, I'm doing for the census because, see, there, they may have formed this census where you mark off how many different races you are. And if you do that, it dilutes your primary race. And so I'm telling these Indians, um, if you're an enrolled Indian or if you use Indian health services or you know, if you identify as an Indian, just put down Indian, don't put down anything else. And I, I just said, uh, one little, two little, three little Indians, that's the only place we count. And then in school, who had the first baby born west of the Mississippi? 
Okay, well, the, the answer you learned in school is Narcissus Whitman. Because Indian babies don't count. Okay, well, you all know this one. Were there any survivors at the Little Bighorn? Were there? Okay, the answer you learned in school. Were there any survivors at the Little Bighorn? No, there weren't any survivors at the Little Bighorn because Indians don't count. Oh, now they get it. God, you guys, you're slow. Let's, <laughs> let's do it again. Who had the first baby born west of the Mississippi? Right. And were there any survivors at the Little Bighorn? That's because you learn that in school, right? Because Indians don't count. So you guys really pay attention to the census. And if, you, if you're eligible to work on it, get in there because we need the right people asking questions. They need to be people who care. Any more give back? Well, on behalf of the faculty, I'd like to thank you, Ramona, for coming and sharing your stories. Um, you know, in these times, we struggle and we struggle, and it's hard to see what's going to change. Um, and so stories like yours are invaluable because um, we can see how hard you had to struggle, um, and you've shown us uh, the real change, uh, the change in laws uh, and change in people's perceptions um, that your work brought about. So thank you for coming. Well, I, you know, I, I, feel, I feel bad because my, uh, my generation, um, we made a pretty big mess, and you guys are going to get stuck cleaning it up. And you don't have much time, so I hope, I hope you all figure it out right away. <laughs>